R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 3, Chapters 28 through 29. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI neural voice. Chapter 28, Gutter Dameron, that is, Twilight of the Gods. After the close of the battles for the Weldon Railroad, Lee returned to Chaffin's Bluff. Neither to his staff nor to the other soldiers he met on his daily rounds did he disclose any of the deep concern he must have felt. He had been a bit irritable at headquarters, where his staff had now been reduced to three, but on the lines he was as cheerful as ever and seemed in good health and spirits. One day, during the operations on the north side of the James, he was standing on the steps of the Libby House when he saw a small and very fat dog come wandering around the corner of the building. His risibles were stirred. Turning to Colonel Thomas H. Carter's courier, Percy Hawes, a youngster whose scant hundred pounds covered the heart of a lion, he said in his gravely jesting voice, Percy, don't you think you would make good soup? During the same engagements, he guided Colonel Carter with great satisfaction because he encountered that intrepid officer's body servant going to the rear with much equipment and jangling utensils of cookery, having served the colonel his breakfast on the line. It was about this time also, when he was in an exposed position, under hot shell fire, that Lee found an excuse for sending his companions to shelter and then stepped out into the open to pick up a tiny sparrow and to return it to the tree from which it had fallen. He must have needed all his self-mastery to maintain his cheerfulness and his calm, for each day seemed to bring new anxieties and new perplexities, personal and official. Robert had been wounded in action on August 15, though not seriously, Custis's health was so uncertain that Mr. Davis was unwilling to assign him to duty in the Shenandoah Valley, where there was a vacancy in the cavalry, Mrs. Lee's condition was as bad as ever. The wear of war was showing on every arm of the service. For a hundred days, Lee told President Davis on August 29, there had not been one without casualties. In the midst of loss, alarms, and exhausting duty, Lee had to take up the old task of reorganization once again. Hampton had shown so much energy and ability that he had been given command of all the cavalry on August 11. He made several excellent suggestions for its betterment, despite the fact that he could do nothing to improve its horses, which were so hard-ridden and so cruelly fly-bitten that they could not fatten, even where they had good pasturage. Hampton, moreover, took a hint from Lee that he might advantageously organize an expedition in rear of Grant's base at City Point, and from this he developed a plan for a raid that, on September 14, was brilliantly executed. It brought 2,486 steers to the Confederate commissary at a time when there was only a 15-day supply of meat in Richmond for Lee's army. This raid served, also, to divert the attention of the army from disasters that now began to fall on other fields of battle. A fine federal fleet under Admiral Farragut on August 5 had destroyed the feeble Confederate craft in Mobile Bay and, at the end, had shot away the rudder chains of Admiral Buchanan's unwieldy ram Tennessee, thereby forcing him to surrender. This action had sealed that port and, to Lee's mind, presaged an early attack on Wilmington. He had not taken over seriously the gloomy forecasts of the pessimistic Whiting, who still commanded on the North Carolina coast, but he now dispatched Beauregard to Wilmington to ascertain the real state of affairs there. Beauregard's report was, on the whole, favorable to Whiting, who had been much criticized by Governor Vance. In Georgia, as in Alabama, the Southern cause was losing. On September 3, the Telegraph announced that Hood, after a series of bloody and imprudent offensives, had been compelled to evacuate Atlanta the previous morning. When this grievous news arrived, Lee was on his way to Richmond to confer with the president, and he doubtless advised him as to the next move by Hood's defeated army. There is, however, no record of their conversation. Hood's retreat depressed the mind of the public and even of the armed forces. Those who had demanded that the president dismiss Johnston now denounced him for having done so. The men in the ranks of the Army of Northern Virginia had never approved of the change of commanders. Mobile Bay closed, Atlanta lost, and, now, disaster to early. That commander had remained north of the Potomac only a few days on his second invasion of Maryland. Upon his return, Lee for a time had not anticipated that Early could do more than keep Sheridan out of the Shenandoah Valley.
There had been some question in Early's mind as to how he could cooperate with Anderson east of the Blue Ridge, for though Anderson advanced no claim to the command, he was Early's senior. Sensing this, and needing Anderson to direct the First Corps, Lee ordered him back. Lee then suggested to Early that he reorganize his command and that he consider alternatives either to undertake an offensive with the aid of Kershaw's division, which had been sent to Northern Virginia on August 6, or else, if he thought a defensive wiser, to return Kershaw secretly to the Richmond Front. Before Early could make any decision, as between the two plans, Sheridan attacked him near Winchester on September 19 and, after a hard-fought action, used the powerful Union cavalry to force Early back two miles. In this, the last battle of Winchester, General Rhodes was killed and Fitz Lee was badly wounded. As soon as Lee learned of this disaster, he directed Kershaw to march at once to Early's support. Ere Kershaw could reach the valley from the eastern side of the Blue Ridge, Early sustained another defeat on the 22D at Fisher's Hill. Losing 12 guns and sustaining severe casualties, he was forced to retreat up the valley. My troops are very much shattered, Early wrote in deep gloom, the men very much exhausted, and many of them without shoes. Lee encouraged Early all he could, sent him Rosser's brigade of cavalry and, lacking a better man for his place, declined to relieve him of command in answer to a clamor akin to that which had arisen against Johnston. The only criticism Lee made was a direct one, to Early himself, that he seemed to have operated more with divisions than with his full command. Even this mild censure did not take into account the immense odds against which Early fought. He was credited by Sheridan with 27,000, but certainly had less than 15,000. Lee did not believe that Sheridan had more than 12,000 infantry when, in reality, he had 32,646, exclusive of the Harper's Ferry Force. Lee never made as great a mistake in computing the strength of an opposing force. But if Lee underestimated Sheridan's numbers, he did not and could not misread the warnings of coming calamity, as written at Mobile, in front of Atlanta, and in the Shenandoah Valley. He did not urge on the government the evacuation of Richmond, for when its defense was his chief mission, his sense of discipline precluded any discussion of the subject. He knew how indispensable the city's munition works were to the Confederacy. Yet it seems probable that he was beginning to consider the advisability of abandoning Richmond and Petersburg, of shortening his communications by retiring to the Staunton River, and of undertaking operations in an open country where he would have a wide field of maneuver. It is possible, also, that Lee was influenced by the views of his father. Light Horse Harry had contended that in defending Virginia against an enemy who controlled the sea, an army might best withdraw inland from the navigable streams. Many of Lee's officers who had been wounded in the early stages of the campaign were now returning to duty and were ending what the chief inspector declared to be the source of almost every evil in the army, the difficulty of having orders properly and promptly executed. But attrition and exhaustion were daily becoming more serious. Finnegan's and Haygood's brigades, for example, had come to Virginia as recently as the spring of 1864, but both were now reduced by two-thirds. On the Howlett line, a couple of artillery companies that had a roster strength of 252 had only 40 men present for duty. Johnson's division had been kept in the trenches, with scarcely any rest, and not only was being worn down but was showing signs of incipient scurvy. The firing on the front was heavier. One small regiment used 36,000 rounds of ammunition in a month. The local defense troops were being called out so often at Richmond that their absence interfered with the flow of munitions and the transaction of governmental business, yet in an emergency they could cover only a short sector of the defenses. Desertion, too, was disgracing and weakening the army. Old commands like Laws and Courses Brigades reported men leaving their posts. In a single Alabama regiment, one lieutenant and 24 men quit and went home. From Johnson's front, where the opposing pickets were close together, men began to slip away almost every night and to go over to the enemy. Meade estimated that an average of 10 Confederates a day were coming into the Union lines. Morale was definitely declining. The strength of the force from White Oak Swamp to the extreme Confederate right, including the Richmond Garrison and Beauregard's command, hardly exceeded 50,000 men at the beginning of the autumn. I get no additions, Lee told Bragg on September 26. The men coming in do not supply the vacancies caused by sickness, desertions, and other casualties.
So great was the need for every private who could carry a musket that Lee could not even furlough the Jewish soldiers for their religious observances. With a few thousand conscripts placed in the strongest parts of his line, Lee believed he could use his veterans advantageously against the enemy, but as matters now stand, he explained to Mr. Davis, we have no troops disposable to meet movements of the enemy or strike when opportunity presents, without taking them from the trenches and exposing some important point. The enemy's position enables him to move his troops to the right or left without our knowledge until he has reached the point at which he aims, and we are then compelled to hurry our men to meet him, incurring the risk of being too late to check his progress and the additional risk of the advantage he may derive from their absence. For the dark emergency these conditions so tragically disclosed, Lee saw but one major policy the government could employ. That was the vigorous enforcement of the Conscription Act of February 17, 1864. This law had restricted the exemptions from service and had extended the age limit for military duty to include every able-bodied white man between the ages of 17 and 50. All from 18 to 45 who were then in the ranks were accounted liable for service until the close of the war. Those between 17 and 18 and those between 45 and 50 who elected to do so could organize as volunteer reserves or minute men, and if they did this they were not subject to call for duty outside their state. Lee urged that this statute be applied to the letter and he called attention to the statement of General Kember that in Virginia alone 40,000 were exempt, were on detail, or had applied for detail and had not then been refused. Urging that every man who was physically fit be brought into the field, he pleaded for the speedy organization of the reserves. In dealing with North Carolina, where difficulty had been encountered in getting out the minute men, he carried on direct correspondence with General Vance, who was on bad terms with the administration. He advocated a general review of the entire conscription service and a consolidation of its activities with those of organizing the reserves. He wanted to be sure, also, that where reservists were given clerkships they were taking the place of able-bodied men who were being sent into the field. In his letters he exhibited none of the deep feeling of the army at the injustice of exemptions, but nothing that he could say to speed up conscription before it would be too late, did he leave unsaid. More vigorously than ever he waged his perennial war on the slackers who sought easy posts, close to home. Besides asking for 5,000 Negro laborers to build roads and fortifications, he recommended that Negroes serve as teamsters and perform all possible labor that would release white men for combat service. To discourage desertion by men who wanted to get into new independent companies that would not be likely to see hard service, he prevailed on the Secretary of War to revoke the permits to organize such units. He even intimated, in one appeal, that leniency would be shown deserters who returned to their duty, and he encouraged desertion from the federal ranks by emulating the Union commanders in promising immunity and transportation to all who came into his lines from the enemy. Exerting himself, in these ways, to the very limits of his official authority, in order to build up his army and to offset attrition, Lee began to speak very plainly, from the time of the seizure of the Weldon Railroad, concerning the inevitable results of unchecked attrition. His views, of course, were expressed only in confidential letters to the administration and were carefully concealed even from his staff and his corps commanders, but they give more than a hint that he believed the Southern cause was becoming hopeless. On August 23rd, he told the Secretary of War, Without some increase of strength, I cannot see how we can escape the natural military consequences of the enemy's numerical superiority, and on September 26, writing General Bragg of his failure to receive enough men to make good his losses, he said, If things thus continue, the most serious consequences must result. Unless Negroes were sent him, promptly, to replace Teamsters, cooks, and hospital attendants, it might be too late. Scarcely had this warning been written than it was emphasized by a tragedy on the north side of the James, a tragedy that might have become a catastrophe. Lee had long been apprehensive of a heavy attack on that part of the defenses, where at the time he had barely 2,000 men, including only two very small brigades of veterans, Johnson's Tennesseans and Gregg's Texans. He instructed Colonel W. Proctor Smith to build a new line of fortifications there, and on September 28th he ordered General Anderson to move north of the James and, under the direction of General Ewell, to assume command. The next morning, early, Lee received a telegram from Ewell announcing that the Federals had made a surprise attack on Fort Harrison and had captured it. As this was one of the most important positions on the outer line of Richmond and was close to the fortifications of Chaffin's Bluff, its loss was serious in itself and might open the road to the capital.
Lee forthwith notified Bragg and directed him to call out the local defense units and all other troops that could be assembled. Telegraphing Ewell to recover the fort, he sent at the same time for General Field, whose troops were on the south side, told him what had happened, and ordered him to cross the James at once. A little later he sent similar instructions to Hoke, whose division, in fine new uniforms, he had reviewed only three days previously. To facilitate Hoke's march, he ordered a special pontoon bridge laid as far down the river as practicable. For regiments from Pickett were also rushed to the north side. Rooney Lee was directed to move his division over, and six field batteries were given similar orders, with the specific instruction that General Alexander go with them to command all the guns used in stopping the enemy's advance. As soon as these movements were underway, Lee went in person to the front. He found that Ewell had skillfully employed Gregg and the Tennessee Brigade in gallant support of Hardaway's battalion of artillery and had managed to retain most of that part of the line lying between Fort Harrison and Fort Gilmer. Bennings and Perry's brigades of Field's division had arrived in time to help these troops beat off a violent attack on Fort Gilmer. Field was for attacking Fort Harrison immediately, but Lee saw that the outer line had been stormed, that the defenders were near exhaustion, that only two brigades of the reinforcements were up, and that a precipitate counterattack was for these reasons dangerous. He accordingly told Field to wait. Soon, Bratton's and Anderson's brigades came up to complete Field's organization. Part of Hoke's men arrived, as did the regiments from Pickett. With this force available Lee seems, for a time, to have considered a night attack, but either because of its difficulties or else because he did not wish to assault until all Hoke's division and ample artillery were available, he deferred operations until the morning of the 30th. Before darkness, as he rode alone behind the lines, he met a very youthful soldier who was some distance behind his command. What are you doing behind, my little fellow?" he asked. The boy explained that he had stopped at a well to fill his company's canteens. Well, said Lee, hurry and catch up, they will need you by daylight. The youngster dutifully struck out down the road, and, when he overtook his comrades, announced to them, in a free interpretation of the general's remarks that Moss Robert had told him they would have hell by daylight. The soldier was wrong as to the hour, but right as to the character of the fighting that occurred on the morning of September 30th. It was past noon when Hoke was in position to attack from a point slightly west of north, while Field was drawn up on a front northwest of the fort. Then the artillery opened a concentrated fire on the work for about half an hour. Field had about 500 yards to go, whereas Hoke could form in a ravine close to the towering earthworks the Federals held. For this reason, as the attack was to be on a brigade front, Field threw out Anderson's brigade, which was to lead his attack, with instructions to advance as close as possible to the Federal position and then to lie down and wait until he saw that he and Hoke's troops would reach the works at the same moment. Anderson, however, did not tell his men they were to halt, and when they got orders to advance, they thought they were to drive their charge home. Seeing them rushing forward, Field had to send Bratton's and Perry's brigades forward in support. When the hot, concentrated fire of the fort forced Anderson back, Bratton and Perry were thrown into confusion, and the whole attack by Field's division soon collapsed, though some of Bratton's men got close to the enemy's new parapet. Hoke must have realized that Field was attacking prematurely, but he waited until the agreed time and then delivered an assault, with the understanding that Bratton was to renew his attack at the same time. But coordination was not on the cards that day. Hoke was so quickly repulsed that Bratton did not make another attempt. At this moment, Lee arrived on the ground and rode along the ranks of Hoke's division as it formed again. A stride traveler, he seemed oblivious to the fire, exposing himself recklessly. His hat was in his hand, his gray hair was shining in the afternoon light. A mighty cheer went up from the North Carolinians when they recognized him. He urged them to the charge. Fort Harrison was an important part of the defenses, he said, and he was sure the men could storm it if they would make one more earnest effort. They shouted their willingness to try, and, at the order, rushed out again, only to be repulsed a second time, in greater disorder and with heavier losses than before. But Lee persisted. I had always thought, one young observer wrote, General Lee was a very cold and unemotional man, but he showed lots of feeling and excitement on that occasion, even the staid and stately traveler cut the spirit of his master, and was prancing and cavorting while the general was imploring his men to make one more effort to take the position for him.
they did not refuse. As courageously as before, they went forward, but when they were repulsed and hurled back, they were not far from panic, and they did not halt until they had reached cover. Fortunately, the enemy did not attempt to follow the repulsed troops or to exploit his success. Gloomily Lee rode back to Chaffin's Bluff, regretfully he had to report to the War Department the failure to recapture Fort Harrison, sadly, he answered General Pemberton when that officer, during the evening, ventured to ask if Lee would not take the fort, cost what it might. General Pemberton, he said, I made my effort this morning and failed, losing my killed and wounded. I have ordered another line provided from that point and shall have no more bloodshed at the fort unless you can show me a practical plan of capture, perhaps you can. I shall be glad to have it." Some of those who heard this answer thought that Lee meant to silence Pemberton with an unforgettable rebuke, but Lee doubtless meant exactly what he said when he affirmed he would be glad to get a better plan. No general more heartily welcomed suggestions at any time and from any source. While Lee was vainly trying to recapture Fort Harrison, Hampton was checking a federal advance that might have carried the Federals to the Southside Railroad. On the 29th, Butler's cavalry, in advance of the Confederate right flank below Petersburg, had been attacked and driven back, but Rooney Lee's division, which was under orders to march to the north side, arrived opportunely and reversed the situation. The next day, September 30, when the Federals again advanced, Haight's division was brought up to support the cavalry. The combined attack of horse and foot repulsed the enemy. On October 1, however, a new advance on Hampton's part was balked by a false report that the enemy was in his rear. Before he could organize a heavy movement, the enemy dug in. To give Hampton sufficient infantry backing, it had been necessary to spread Johnson's division to the right and to leave scarcely more than a picket line on part of the Petersburg defenses. If the enemy cannot be prevented from extending his left, Lee warned Hampton, he will eventually reach the Appomattox and cut us off from the south side altogether. Dutifully, Hampton began drawing a line that would extend to Hatcher's run and would remove, for the time at least, any serious danger that the Federals would envelop Petersburg. This, however, meant still more attenuation of force. By October 7 Johnson's division was holding a front previously occupied by that command, by Hoke's division, and by two brigades of Mahone. In an emergency that arose before the end of the month, his division, plus two brigades and one battalion, occupied the whole of the Petersburg defenses from the Appomattox to Battery 45, a distance of nearly six miles. Lee saw early and plainly what this endless extension of line involved. Ere the line to Hatcher's run had been started, or even his plan for operating on the north side after the capture of Fort Harrison had been drafted, he wrote the Secretary of War a new appeal for men. In this, for the first time, he spoke of the fall of Richmond as possibility. He said, I beg leave to inquire whether there is any prospect of my obtaining any increase to this army. If not, it will be very difficult for us to maintain ourselves. The enemy's numerical superiority can only meet his corps, increased by recent recruits, with a division reduced by long and arduous service. We cannot fight to advantage with such odds, and there is the gravest reason to apprehend the result of every encounter. The men at home on various pretexts must be brought out and be put in the army at once, unless we would see the enemy reap the great moral and material advantages of a successful issue of his most costly campaign. If we can get out our entire arms-bearing population in Virginia and North Carolina and relieve all detailed men with Negroes, we may be able, with the blessing of God, to keep the enemy in check to the beginning of winter. If we fail to do this, the result must be calamitous. The discouragement of our people and the great material loss that would follow the fall of Richmond, to say nothing of the great encouragement our enemies would derive from it, outweigh, in my judgment, any sacrifice and hardship that would result from bringing out all our arms-bearing men. The army was beginning to feel even more than Lee expressed in this letter. Colonel Taylor, with the optimism of youth, argued that the capture of Fort Harrison was a negative gain for the enemy, but he had to admit that in the attempt to recover that position matters were not executed as well as they were planned, and he wondered if all was well with the morale of the army. Perhaps he was not aware of the full import of his words when he wrote his fiancée, though our men have not altogether the old spirit, there still are many who will do anything to be expected of mortals, and if this fraction is properly supported, all is well.
truth was that while conscripts were not arriving in sufficient quotas to strengthen the army materially in numbers, enough of them were being sent in to impair the morale and to destroy the old-time confidence of the commanders in the invincibility of their men. This was grimly illustrated early in October when Lee undertook a movement to recover the exterior line held by the Federals above Fort Harrison as an alternative to the construction of a retrenchment between it and the line to the west. He called out the local defense troops and put them in the works. Thus set free for an attack, Field and Hoke were moved up the line and Gary's cavalry and Perry's brigade were marched beyond its northern end. The plan was that Gary's men, dismounted, and the infantry of Perry's brigade were to sweep down in rear of the line. Field was then to assault from the west and, if successful in crossing the works, was to join the troops already on the outer side of the exterior line, Hoke was thereupon to attack from the inner side. The whole of the line was to be recovered as far to the southward as the close artillery range of Fort Harrison. On the 6th Lee had a conference with the President at Chaffin's Bluff and on the morning of the 7th he rode up to Field's front to see the action open. After a while, he inquired of one of his staff if the troops were ready to go forward. None but the Texas Brigade, General, the officer replied. The Texas Brigade is always ready, Lee commented, half proudly, half sadly. Soon the advance began. Gary and the little remnant of the Florida Brigade pushed forward, turning the works, Field quickly cleared the line and, pursuing the Federals, came upon them in a strong position, well covered by Abydos. At this stage of the advance Hoke was to join in the attack from the western side of the exterior line, but for some reason, never explained, he either misunderstood his orders, was deterred by the obstacles in his way, or was held back by the artillery fire of the enemy. Field attacked again, but at doleful cost, for the valiant Greg fell, killed by a ball through the neck. As Lee was watching the struggle, a boy of 18 or 19, his uniform all bloody, came up to him. General, he said, if you don't send some more men down there, our boys will get hurt sure. Are you wounded, my boy? Lee inquired. Yes, sir. Where are you wounded? I'm shot through both arms, General, but I don't mind that, General. I want you to send some more men down there to help our boys. Lee placed the boy in charge of one of his staff, to be carried to a surgeon, and turned to see what could be done. But it was too late. Struggling through a jumble of small timber, Field was repulsed while Hoke waited. So it was, time after time, in the battles of the late summer and autumn. On every field there were individual exploits as fine as those of 62. The veterans were as valiant as ever. But, somehow, the old machine was not working as in earlier days. Lee was convinced by this affair, by the operations of October 1-2 on the right at Petersburg, and by the reports of his scouts, that the Federals were planning a further extension of their lines on both flanks, and on the 10th of October he issued a general warning. We must drive them back at all costs, he told his corps commanders, but to General Cooper he confided, in an explanation of Grant's anticipated movement, I fear it will be impossible to keep him out of Richmond. Abandoning all hope of recovering Fort Harrison on the exterior works, he drew a retrenchment that cut off the fort and secured the front. The day this was done, he had the satisfaction of seeing Field repulse the enemy's repeated attacks from his new position. It was, however, an immense relief to Lee on the 19th to be able to welcome Longstreet back and to place in his experienced hands the defense of the north side, where, it had to be admitted, Anderson had not distinguished himself. Anderson was assigned command of Hoax and of Johnson's divisions, which were informally organized as a separate Fourth Corps. Longstreet was still unable to use his right arm, but he had learned to write with his left hand and was fully capable of resuming command of his old corps. Characteristically, he at once asked that Lee bring together his three divisions on the north side, and he went vigorously to work strengthening his front. In Longstreet's eyes, Lee seemed worn by past labor, besides suffering at seasons from sciatica, while his work was accumulating and his troubles multiplying to proportions that should have employed half a dozen able men. Yet for a part of the month of October, Lee had only two members of his personal staff on duty. Both Colonel Venable and Colonel Marshall were sick. To the burdens that Longstreet described, the next son after that officer's return put a new load of anxiety on the weary shoulders of Lee.
Following the Battle of Fisher's Hill, General Early had retired up the valley as far as Waynesboro, but hearing that Sheridan had reduced force, he had again advanced northward. Lee had urged Breckinridge to reinforce Early, if possible, so that Kershaw could be recalled, and on the 12th of October he sent Early a lengthy letter of instructions, cautioning him not to employ his cavalry recklessly. If, Sheridan, he wrote, should remain in the lower valley and send reinforcements to Grant, you can reinforce me correspondingly and watch him with the rest of your troops. It is impossible at this distance to give definite instructions, you can only proceed on the principle of not retaining with you more troops than you can use to advantage in any position the enemy may take and send the rest to me. I have weakened myself very much to strengthen you. It was done with the expectation of enabling you to gain such success that you return the troops if not rejoin me yourself. I know you have endeavored to gain that success and believe you have done all in your power to ensure it. You must not be discouraged, but continue to try. I rely upon your judgment and ability and the hearty cooperation of your officers and men still to secure it. With your united force, it can be accomplished. I do not think Sheridan's infantry or cavalry numerically as large as you suppose, but either is sufficiently so not to be despised and great circumspection must be used in your operations. Grant is receiving large reinforcements and building up his army as large apparently as at the beginning of the campaign. This makes it necessary for me to draw to me every man I can. In the exercise of the discretion thus given him, Early decided to assume the offensive, and on the 19th he attacked Sheridan near Cedar Creek. The battle was as during the forenoon, but in the afternoon some of his infantry broke, the enemy's cavalry outflanked him and he was forced into a disorderly retreat with the loss of 23 guns and about 3,000 men. This meant, of course, that all prospect of a diversion in the Valley of Virginia was at an end. Grant need have no further concern for Washington. Lee's old game of playing on Lincoln's fears for the safety of the capital could not be tried again. More than that, it was doubtful whether Early, with the 12,000 men left him, could keep the enemy from completing the destruction of the food supplies in the valley or even prevent his marching eastward over the mountains. Sheridan could reduce force to assist Grant, Lee could not weaken Early except at great risk. A dark autumn was growing blacker. On his own front, Lee became apprehensive of a new attack, especially as the Federals were digging furiously on Dutch Gap Canal, where some Confederate prisoners were kept under fire in retaliation for alleged forced labor by Negro soldiers the Confederates had captured. Lee put an end to this through correspondence with Grant. Doing what he could to procure the cooperation of the Navy in preventing an advance up the river, he remained at Chaffin's Bluff, busy with preparations to meet the next shock. On October 2526, there were signs of an increase in the federal force on the north side of the James, and on the morning of the 27th the enemy attacked vigorously on the whole front from the New Market to the Charles City Road. Simultaneously, Lee received reports that the Union troops had crossed Hatcher's Run on the right of the Petersburg Front and were moving toward the Boydton Plank Road. Taylor remarked, it looks like a sure enough advance, and Colonel Marshall, in more formal phrase, notified the Secretary of War, there, appears to be a simultaneous movement on both flanks. The administration was profoundly alarmed and called the last available reserves, the munition workers and the cadets, to the defenses. Counteroperations on the south side had, of course, to be left to the judgment of Hill and of Hampton. On the north side, Lee left the dispositions to Longstreet. And never did he have better reason to trust the military judgment of Old Pete. The front opposite Fort Harrison had been carefully planted with subterra shells or landmines after the capture of that earthwork, so Longstreet had nothing to fear on that sector, which the Chaffin's Bluff garrison manned. He concentrated Hoke and Field on the front of attack and soon became convinced that the attack there was merely a feint. Shrewdly reasoning that the Federals might be preparing to turn the upper end of the outer line, which was undefended, he boldly moved his infantry as far northward as the Williamsburg Road and sent Gary's cavalry to occupy the fortifications on the Nine Mile Road. In the course of a few hours, he completely repulsed the enemy and captured some 600 prisoners and 11 flags. No drive on the north side, during the whole of the investment of Richmond, had been broken up so readily. On the south side, the Federals crossed Hatcher's Run at Armstrong's Mill and Rowanty Creek at Monk's Neck Bridge. Their numbers were large and their advance was rapid. 
Hampton met them by shifting his attack from road to road with a skill and a speed that would have done credit to Stuart himself. Hill hurried Haight and Mahone from the line where they had been on a quiet sector. This left Johnson to defend the front from the Appomattox to Battery 45 with six brigades and one battalion, while three of Wilcox's brigades covered the right of the new line from Battery 45 to Hatcher's Run. The enemy reached Burgess's Mill on Hatcher's Run, but as the two strong Federal Corps failed to cooperate, the combined attacks of the Confederate infantry and cavalry drove the Union troops back in confusion. It was in a spectacular charge during this fighting along the Boydton Plank Road that Hampton had one of his sons killed and another seriously wounded. Despite this personal affliction, he proposed to renew the action at dawn. Hill, however, was unwilling to leave the Petersburg line so thinly held, especially as there was a surprise attack that evening on Johnson's front, near the Baxter Road. The morning of October 28 found Hill back in position, the Federals withdrawn to their lines, and Hampton in possession of the field. Thus ended the most ambitious of the Federal attempts in the autumn of 1864 to outflank the Richmond-Petersburg line. It closed with substantial Confederate victory. Some began to hope that it was the last great effort of the year, because the weather, which had been mild and open in October, became uncertain with the opening of November, good and bad by turns, as General Haygood said. Satisfied that the north side was temporarily safe, Lee started back on November 1 for Petersburg. He made the journey something of a tour of inspection and that day covered the whole of the front from Chaffin's Bluff along the Howlett Line to the city. On reaching Petersburg, he went to new headquarters. A change from Violet Bank had become necessary, for, with the fall of the leaves, that pleasant place was in plain view of the enemy's batteries across the Appomattox. Lee had approved a move and Taylor had selected the comfortable Beasley House on High Street. The general, however, allowed himself only a single night's rest before starting out to examine the new line on the right. Next he went down as far as Rowanti Creek, where he joined Rooney and Robert, then on outpost duty. It was as happy a meeting as the times would allow. Both boys were well and cheerful. Robert's wound had healed and Rooney had new laurels, one in Hampton's battle on the Boydton Plank Road. Remaining on the extreme right several days, Lee found that most of the soldiers in the trenches were in good health, though the men who were doing fatigue duty, in the endless labor of constructing or strengthening fortifications, were beginning to show physical weakness because of the poor ration. Sometimes their food was fairly abundant, more often the third of a pound of Nassau bacon that was issued with the daily pint of cornmeal was so bad that the facetious affirmed the enemy let it pass the blockade in order to poison the army. Once, when transportation was interrupted, there was only a single issue of meat in four days. Firewood was scarce and green, soap was not to be had. Dirty and cold, the men dug themselves small caves in rear of the trenches, caves that were popularly known as rat holes and officially styled bombproofs, despite the oft-repeated experience that they were not proof. The troops were beginning to lack even the means of defense. Percussion caps were running low, though most of the stills in the South that had been dedicated to Bacchus had now been sacrificed to Mars. The Confederates in the advanced rifle pits were limited to 18 rounds per man, while the Federal pickets who fraternized with them between the lines complained that each of them was required to expend 100 rounds every 24 hours. The distress of his soldiers wrung the heart of Lee, and the scantiness of their numbers gave him the deepest concern for the future. After his first day of inspection, he wrote the President, The great necessity I observed yesterday was the want of men, and on every rod of the line he visited after his return to his Petersburg headquarters he read the same warning. With all the troops on the works he could present, at best, only one man every four and a half feet. H. H. Walker's brigade was diminished before the end of November to such feebleness that it was disbanded, and Johnson's Tennessee brigade, which had fought so well at Fort Harrison, was consolidated with archers. In Early's command, Terry's brigade contained the fragments of 13 regiments, and York had the remnants of 10 regiments in his brigade. Desertion grew as ominously as a cancer. Johnson's reports told almost daily of men who had been unable to endure the ceaseless vigil of the freezing trenches and had crossed over the lines to safety, if to infamy. Usually, the deserters were new conscripts, but sometimes they seduced older soldiers from their allegiance. Among the local defense troops, on the Richmond front, 45 desertions occurred in a short time because these reservists feared they were to be retained permanently in the army.
Lee hurried the munition workers back to Richmond, both because of their low morale and also because the men were needed in the plants, but the exigencies were such that they were soon put in the trenches again. Lee had to be stern in the face of the steady loss of men, but if he were not sure that justice had been done a deserter, he would personally see to it that the man had the benefit of the doubt. On one occasion he got up at 2 a.m. and intervened with the president because he was afraid that a German deserter might not have understood the published orders. It probably was in connection with desertion that Lee had distressing evidence during November that the exhaustion which was threatening the army was wearing down the sensitive nerves of the president. Longstreet's adjutant general reported that General Pickett had about 100 men in his guardhouse charged with desertion. He explains the state of things, the letter read, by the fact that every man sentenced to be shot for desertion in this division for the past two months had been reprieved. A little earlier, Lee had been disposed to deal leniently with deserters who returned to the army, but he forwarded this document to the War Department with the endorsement, desertion is increasing in the army notwithstanding all my efforts to stop it. I think a rigid execution of the law is, best, in the end. The great want in our army is firm discipline. Through channels, this reached the president. It touched him on the old, sore spot of his constitutional prerogative. He wrote tartly, in a tone he rarely employed with Lee, familiar though it unhappily was to some of the other Confederate leaders, when deserters are arrested they should be tried, and if the sentences are reviewed and remitted that is not a proper subject for the criticism of a military commander. Lee made no reply. To meet the losses due to attrition and desertion, it was now apparent that the reservists would be of little value. The only hope lay in conscription and in the substitution of disabled soldiers and Negroes for the able-bodied white men who were on detail. For a while in October there had been hopeful signs of replacements from farmers who had harvested their crops, but before the end of that month Lee had been forced to tell Hampton, the only source we have to depend upon is the conscription now going on. Lee continued to urge the organization of Negroes in the service of supply and in this he had the warm support of the president, who asked the approval of Congress. Detailed men were slow in arriving, conscripts were few. From early, when it was apparent that Sheridan did not intend to follow up his victory at Cedar Creek, Lee recalled Kershaw's division about November 14, but that shattered unit of the old First Corps, which he placed north of the James, was all he felt he could as yet safely detach from the valley. There was some increase in the cavalry, but the shortage of horses was so great that of the 6,200 troopers with Lee, about 1,300 were dismounted. For all the efforts of Lee, the President and the War Department, the maximum strength of all arms reached in the return of November 30 was 60,753, exclusive of the Richmond garrison of something less than 6,000. This was a gain, but not enough, in Lee's opinion, to give him any prospect of victory. Unless we can obtain a reasonable approximation to Grant's force, he wrote the president early that month, I fear a great calamity will befall us. While Lee was thus vainly using all his prestige and all his influence to bring the Army of Northern Virginia up to fighting strength in November, Grant undertook no offensive operations on a large scale. In the valley of the Shenandoah, Early waited, with his reduced force, gloomy and uneasy. Off Wilmington, whither Bragg had been sent in general command, subject to Lee's control, there was as yet no increase in the blockading fleet to indicate an early attack, though Lee expected that Port or Charleston soon to be assailed. He urged that the garrison at either place be ready to assist that of the other. In the far south were direful developments. Largely at Lee's instance, General Beauregard had been slated to assume charge of the department where Hood was operating. Beauregard had bidden Lee an affectionate farewell about September 23 and had gone first to Charleston. Then he had been assigned to his new post of duty, but he had no real authority. Hood made his own plans, with the acquiescence of the president. After sending Forrest on a brilliant raid against Sherman's railroad communications, Hood decided to attempt to force Sherman out of Georgia by marching his army into Tennessee. This was, perhaps, the fatal military decision of the war. If Lee was consulted regarding it, there is no record of the advice he gave. On November 16, while had tramped toward Nashville, Sherman boldly abandoned his communications with Tennessee and started on his march across Georgia to the sea.
For two weeks there was suspense, then, on November 30th, Hood met Schofield at Franklin, Tennessee, and in a wild, reckless, and wasteful battle threw him back on Nashville, where George H. Thomas was concentrating force in a determination to destroy Hood and to leave Sherman free to move on Savannah. These events sent a shiver down the spine of every Confederate. Could anything be done to check Sherman's advance? Would Lee be able to send troops to oppose him? Feverishly, the question was debated. It probably was the subject most anxiously discussed at a conference between the President and Lee on the 22d of November and it was not easily answered. For Grant seemed to be cooperating shrewdly with his lieutenant in Georgia. Lee's information was that the Army of the Potomac had received 12 days rations and was preparing a flank movement in an effort to keep him from detaching troops against Sherman. Lee at once made ready to attack Grant, and on November 21st even considered abandoning the valley and concentrating everything for one final thrust, but Grant's anticipated movement did not occur and the weather temporarily put a stop to operations. Bragg was forthwith sent southward from Wilmington with half the forces there, in the hope that he might organize a small army at Augusta, Georgia, to attack Sherman. No decision was made, and none could be reached, as to a detachment from Lee's army, because Grant speedily became most active again. On the 29th, there were signs of a new shift of troops to the north side of the James. The next week, when the fickle weather changed again for the better, all the signs pointed to another outflanking movement. I think we are ready, Taylor wrote, and hope with God's help for success. Lee made no predictions, but watched every move and studied carefully every spy's report. On December 5, the scouts brought in dark news, the well-led Six Corps, which had been fighting against early in the Shenandoah Valley, had rejoined Grant. Heavier odds against the weary Army of Northern Virginia increased probability that Grant would try once again to swing around one flank or the other, virtual certainty that the Army of Northern Virginia could not detach even a regiment to hope in holding back Sherman, could Lee do anything to offset this turn of affairs? There was only one move he could make on the chessboard of war, as Grant had recalled part of his troops from Sheridan, Lee might bring back part of the Second Corps without subjecting Early to the threat of immediate destruction. Accordingly, Gordon's division was ordered to start for Petersburg as soon as Lee was sure of the return of the VI Corps to Grant. Early's division, now under John Pegram, followed it at once. On Longstreet's assurance that the north side was measurably safe, Lee prepared to transfer Hoke to the south side again and to turn over his lines to Kershaw. When Gordon arrived from the valley, he was marched through Petersburg and was placed on the extreme right. This hurried reconcentration did not counterbalance the return of the VI Corps to Grant, but it made the odds less serious. Moreover, it relieved the cavalry and left a P. Hill's Corps available for employment in meeting new flank operations. Before Gordon got into position, the Federals, on December 7, undertook a raid down the Weldon Railroad. Lee interpreted this to be an attempt to occupy Weldon and he at once sent Hill to support Hampton, who had put his men on the march at the first report of the enemy's move. Longstreet was ordered to attack on the north side, if possible, to keep the enemy from further enterprises. The weather cooperated, for once, by turning discouragingly cold on the 8th. The enemy got as far as Belfield, but could not cross the Meharan River to Hicksford or destroy the bridge in the face of the battery that had been constructed to protect the crossing. When the Federals were forced to turn back, their rations being near exhaustion, Hampton's cavalry skirmished hotly on their flanks and took some prisoners. Hill, however, could not overhaul them and they returned unpunished. A simultaneous demonstration on Hatcher's run amounted to little. The enemy had torn up more of the track of the Weldon Railroad than Lee had thought, 16 miles instead of 6, but had done little additional military damage. There was some disappointment in the army that Hill had not engaged the Federal infantry. Sherman's march to the sea was, meantime, progressing ominously, and the question of detaching troops from the Army of Northern Virginia became even more pressing. Lee considered it likely that Sheridan would reinforce Grant and that an attempt might be made to break the Confederate center through the Dutch Gap Canal, which was now nearing completion. For this reason it was dangerous, he thought, to weaken his forces. In the emergency, however, he felt that he could detach a division if Grant were not reinforced by Sheridan, and, as always, he expressed willingness to do more if the administration so directed. Davis, in a quandary, left the decision to Lee.
when he heard that the snow was six inches deep in the Shenandoah Valley, Lee, on December 14, ordered Rhodes's division to return to Petersburg. This stripped early of nearly his whole command, but it gave Lee some guarantee that if he had to dispatch a force to Georgia, he could replace a part of it. With its gallant commander left behind in his grave in the valley, Rhodes's division reached Petersburg on December 18. But the telegraph that told of his approach also brought dread tidings. On the 15th and 16th, Hood had met Thomas in front of Nashville and had been hopelessly routed. On the 19th a great armada from Hampton Roads, 85 steamers altogether, arrived off Wilmington. The same day Beauregard announced from Savannah that Sherman was approaching and had demanded the surrender of the place. The city, he said, must be evacuated, as soon as practicable. The loss of Savannah will be followed by that of the railroad from Augusta to Charleston and soon after of Charleston itself. Cannot Hoke and Johnson's divisions be spared for defense of South Carolina until part of or whole of Hood's army could reach Georgia? Davis could not bring himself to believe that Beauregard's forecast was correct, but he turned to Lee for counsel, with the old, old question, what reinforcements could Lee send south? And should they go to Wilmington or to South Carolina? As calmly as he weighed every other question, and without any evidence of the profound anxiety he must have felt, Lee concluded that the danger to Wilmington was more imminent, and, for all the odds on his own front, he ordered Longstreet to send a division to the North Carolina port. Longstreet selected hoax. On the morning of December 20, Lee conferred with Longstreet and with Hoke, and started one of the latter's brigades for Wilmington over the long route via Danville and Greensboro. The railroad equipment was now near collapse. Cars were few and locomotives were scarcely able to crawl over the worn tracks. It was the 22 d before the last of Hoke's men left Richmond. Kershaw and Field took over their lines, and Rhodes's division was temporarily sent to Longstreet on the north side. At this juncture, on December 2223, from a front that was dangerously thin, Longstreet had to detach two brigades to meet a raid on Gordonsville, but they were lucky enough to drive the enemy off and return so promptly that their absence had no serious consequences. The movement of Hoke's division southward from Danville was incredibly slow, so slow that suspicion of treachery on the part of the Piedmont Railroad was widespread in the army. By Christmas Day only the leading brigade had reached Wilmington, and by the afternoon of December 26 scarcely 400 of the next brigade had arrived. For a time it looked as though the delay would be fatal, but, as it happened, the attack was abortive. Union troops were landed and a powder ship was blown up in the mistaken belief that the concussion would destroy Fort Fisher, the main defense of the town. As no damage was done, the land forces returned to their ships, and on the 28th, the fleet steamed away. This was, of course, a relief to Lee and to the administration, but the good news that Wilmington was still open to the blockade runners meant little compared to the baleful tidings that on December 21st Sherman had marched into Savannah. Hood's army Iraq, Georgia and the Gulf states cut off from Virginia, Sherman soon to be ready to march up the coast and to capture Charleston, the Army of the Potomac every day more powerful and better able to outflank Lee, no matter what his vigilance, or what his strategy, Sheridan free to return with his overwhelming cavalry, surely, when the last December sun of 1864 set over the Petersburg defenses it brought the twilight of the Confederacy. Chapter 29 The Winter of Growing Despair Anxious as had been the months of November and December, 1864, there had been some hours when Lee could think of other things than troop movements, and after the repulse of the attack on Fort Fisher, while Sherman waited in Savannah, there came a brief respite. Fortunately, Lee's health continued good, though he looked much older. He rarely showed any sign of his gnawing anxiety and was ceaselessly active. After he had completed his inspection of the lines on the right, early in November, he had returned to Petersburg, and then, about November 25th, had decided to move headquarters farther toward the right, whither Grant seemed perpetually to be extending his flank in his efforts to reach the Southside Railroad. Lee had wished to remain in a tent, where his visitors would be no disturbance to others, but Mrs. Lee and Walter Taylor between them had prevailed on him to accept the invitation of the Turnbull family and to establish himself at their home, Edge Hill, which was about two miles west of Petersburg, on a healthy, convenient, and accessible site. After locating the general and my associates of the staff, Taylor wrote at the time, I concluded that I would have to occupy one of the miserable little back rooms, but the gentlemen of the house suggested that I should take the parlor.
I think that the general was pleased with his room, and on entering mine he remarked, Ah, you are finely fixed. Couldn't you find any other room? No, I replied, but this will do. I can make myself tolerably comfortable here. He was struck dumb with amazement at my impudence, and soon vanished. The quarters were, indeed, the best Lee had ever had during his campaigning, a fact which probably caused him some inward twinges, for Taylor believed the general was never so well satisfied as when he was living like a Spartan. But if the rooms were pleasant, headquarters fare was of the scantiest. When General Ewell visited him, Lee insisted that his guest have his lunch, which consisted of two cold sweet potatoes. An Irish M.P. who came to Edge Hill remarked to Mrs. Pryor, who had furnished him a room, because Lee could not, you should have seen Uncle Robert's dinner today, madam. He had two biscuits, and he gave me one. Another day the Irishman reported, what a glorious dinner today, madam. Somebody sent Uncle Robert a box of sardines. Lee's chief recreation, during many unoccupied hours, was entertaining children. The Federals had ceased bombarding the town during November, but on the 28th they had opened fire again, deliberately, Lee thought, for, as he remarked to Rev. Henry C. Clay, whenever a house was set on fire, we saw the fire of the enemy increased and converging on that point. Lee was distressed that the bursting of the shells kept his young friends from playing in the city streets, and occasionally he would send in a wagon and bring them out to headquarters, where they could frolic, free of danger. One day he was riding back to town with a party of youngsters, when a young guest began to whip the mules to make them go faster. Don't do that, my little child, he said. The girl forgot after a few minutes and struck the beasts a second time. And, he said, sternly but sadly, you must not do that again. My conscience is not entirely at ease about using these animals for this extra service, for they are half-fed, as we all are. Once he spent a few moments playing with a child who was sick Abed, and on a Sunday when he entered a crowded chapel and found a plainly dressed little miss vainly looking for a seat, he escorted her to the pew that was reserved for him and had her remain at his side during the service. Yesterday afternoon, he wrote Mrs. Lee in January, three little girls walked into my room, each with a small basket. The eldest carried some fresh eggs, laid by her own hens, the second, some pickles made by her mother, the third, some popcorn grown in her garden. I have not had so pleasant a visit for a long time. I fortunately was able to fill their baskets with apples, which distressed poor Brian, and I begged them to bring me nothing but kisses and to keep the eggs, corn, etc., for themselves. Another recreation, though rare, was that of reading a new book. He lingered affectionately, no doubt, over the life story of that admiring old friend and chief from whom, in April, 1861, he had found it so difficult to part. I have put in the bag General Scott's autobiography, which I thought you might like to read, he wrote Mrs. Lee late in the winter. The general, of course, stands out prominently and does not hide his light under a bushel, but appears the bold, sagacious, truthful man he is. His rides into Petersburg and his visits to Richmond were a comfort to him, of course. In Petersburg he called often on Mrs. A. P. Hill, the young and lovely wife of the commander of the Third Corps. General Lee comes very frequently to see me, Mrs. Hill wrote her mother, all in a breath, he is the best and greatest man on earth, brought me the last time some delicious apples. When the general went home to Richmond, it was always to find Mrs. Lee more and more a cripple, though she was interested in everything and kept her needles busy knitting socks for the soldiers. The capital was more crowded than ever, dejected and negligently dilapidated. Sometimes, from the sad seniors, Lee would turn away to the children. I don't want to see you, he would say half in jest and half in reproof, you are too gloomy and despondent, where is? And he would name the little girl of the family. The young bells of the town were much in doubt whether it was proper to have dances at so dark a time, and a committee of them asked his advice, with the assurance that if he disapproved, they would not dance a single step. Why, of course, my dear child, he answered. My boys need to be heartened up when they get their furloughs. Go on, look your prettiest, and be just as nice to them as ever you can be. At Christmas time, when Savannah had fallen and the fate of Wilmington seemed to hang by a thread, he went to Richmond to see his family, but he could not stay more than a day. On his return, he learned that some of his friends had sent him a saddle of mutton to brighten the mess at Edge Hill. It went astray, however, and never reached him.
If the soldiers get it, he said, simply, in report its non-arrival, I shall be content. I can do very well without it. In fact, I should rather they should have it than I. At a Yuletide dinner in Petersburg he was no little embarrassed because he wanted to save his portion of turkey so that he could carry it to one of his staff officers who, as he explained, had been very ill and had nothing to eat but cornbread and sweet potato coffee. When a barrel of turkeys arrived for himself and his staff he ordered his fowl sent to the hospital and he announced his purpose in such a tone that the other officers sadly repacked the barrel and sent all its contents to the scanty mess of the convalescents. He discouraged personal gifts as far as he could. Daily, for three months after he came to Petersburg, the wife of Judge W. W. Crump, a distinguished jurist of Richmond, sent fresh bread to his mess by a special messenger. Although it is very delicious, he felt constrained to write her, I must beg you to cease sending it. I cannot consent to tax you so heavily. In these times, no one can supply their families and furnish the army, too. We have plenty to eat and our appetites are so good that they do not require tempting. There was much to be done, during this period and throughout the winter, in maintaining the morale of the officers, for many of them now regarded the Southern cause as lost. In their private speculations as to how long the Confederacy could survive, few affirmed that even the Army of Northern Virginia could resist the enemy longer than July, 1865. Carelessness increased, drinking became worse. Lee had constantly to be stirring some of his subordinates to vigilance. Occasionally he would snub a man whom he thought had been needlessly absent, sometimes he would present his coldest mien to those he found loafing at headquarters, if an officer seemed to be too dainty about his food, Lee would chaff him with exaggerated attention. When a man complained of injustice on the part of his superiors, Lee would urge him to his full duty and not to fear the consequences. The sick or captured officer was always his special care. To the family of wounded or captured men, as well as to the kin of one who was killed, he was quick to send his condolence. Furloughs he had to decline, even in a case so pathetic as that of General Pendleton, who wished to go home to baptize the posthumous child of his son Sandy, who had been killed in Early's Valley Campaign. So far as circumstances permitted, Lee continued to give encouragement and to administer rebukes by tactful suggestion. Writing out one day in January, 1865, he inquired of General John B. Gordon and of General Haight concerning the progress being made on two heavy redoubts that were under construction on Hatcher's Run. Gordon assured him that his fort was nearly finished. Haight said, with some embarrassment, I think the fort on my side of the run also about finished, sir. Lee decided to go with them and to see for himself. Gordon's works were in the conditions described. On Haight's front, the digging had scarcely begun. General, said Lee, you say this fort is about finished? I must have misunderstood my engineers, sir. But you did not speak of your engineers. You spoke of the fort as nearly completed. Haight was riding a very spirited horse that had been presented to his wife, and in his humiliation he must have tugged at the reins, for the animal began to prance about excitedly. General, said Lee, in his blandest manner, doesn't Mrs. Haight ride that horse occasionally? Yes, sir. Well, General, you know that I am very much interested in Mrs. Haight's safety. I fear that horse is too nervous for her to ride without danger, and I suggest that in order to make him more quiet, you ride him at least once a day to this fort. That was all, but it was a rebuke that sank into the heart of Haight. One evening the general came upon a group of young officers who were working over a bit of mathematics, drinking all the while from two tin cups that were replenished at the mouth of a jug that had a guilty, bibulous look. Lee solved their problem for them and went his way with no reference to their refreshment, but the next morning, when one of the group began to recount a very curious dream of the night, Lee quietly observed, that is not at all remarkable. When young gentlemen discuss at midnight mathematical problems, the unknown quantities of which are a stone jug and two tin cups, they may expect to have strange dreams. He was always careful, however, never to rebuke an officer of rank in the presence of others. On a tour of inspection with Gordon he found some earthworks that had been very badly located, and he said so in plain words. Turning, however, he noticed some young officers with an earshot, so he added audibly, but these works were laid out by skilled engineers, who probably know their business better than we do.
If Lee had on occasion to admonish officers during that dreadful winter, he likewise had occasion to be grateful to some of them, and to none more than to Brigadier General Archibald Gracie for an act of a kind that Lee best appreciated. One day in November he had been on the lines with Gracie, who commanded a brigade in Johnson's division. Being perhaps unfamiliar with the deadliness of the sharpshooting on that part of the front, Lee carelessly stood up on the parapet. Gracie, without a word, instantly interposed his body between that of Lee and the enemy. Both were pulled back over the works before either was hit, but Lee never forgot the spirit Gracie exhibited. A few weeks later, on December 3, Gracie was killed by a fragment of shrapnel on a point on the fortifications where there was not supposed to be any danger. Through these anxious days, as always, Lee's reliance was on a power which, as he wrote Mr. Davis at the time he recalled Rhodes's division from the valley, will cause all things to work together for our good. Again he told Mrs. Lee, I pray daily and almost hourly to our Heavenly Father to come to the relief of you and our afflicted country. I know he will order all things for our good, and we must be content. The type of his prayer book having become too small for his vision, he mentioned the fact one day to Mrs. Churchill J. Gibson, wife of the rector of Grace Church, Petersburg, and said that he intended to give it to some soldier. He remarked, as he spoke, that the volume was the one he had used during the Mexican War. Mrs. Gibson at once offered to give him several new copies of the prayer book in exchange for so interesting a memento. Lee gladly agreed and distributed the new books through one of his chaplains to men who asked for them. In each copy he inscribed a line of presentation. Yet, faithfully as he used his new book of devotion, with the humility that marked his every act, he doubted if his own prayers would avail. In an exchange of letters with General Pendleton, during the autumn, when Pendleton explained that he had omitted to say grace at the general's table because he did not know his chief had asked him to do so, Lee said, I am deeply obliged to you for your fervent prayers in my behalf. No one stands in greater need of them. My feeble petitions I dare hardly hope will be answered. A nation's prayers, and not an individual's only, were needed as January, 1865, passed. Hourly along the line of 35 miles from the Williamsburg Road to the unstable right flank on Hatcher's Run the pickets kept their rifles barking, and the sharpshooters watched the embrasures on the reddish-yellow parapet across the fields. Nightly the fuse of each bomb could be traced, like giant's fireworks, from the mouth of the mortar through the high trajectory and back again to earth. Never was there silence, never a day without casualties, yet from the time of the raid on Belfield in December, 1864, until February, 1865, there was no large action on the Richmond-Petersburg front, largely because of the condition of the roads. Elsewhere, calamity followed on the heels of disaster. Before the middle of January, it became apparent that Sherman would soon start his advance from Savannah toward Charleston. There were only scattered forces to oppose him. Kershaw's old brigade, now under General James Connor, was immediately ordered to Charleston. Cavalry was much needed there. After conference with President Davis, Lee dispatched Butler's division to the Palmetto State and authorized General Hampton to go thither, also, in the hope that his great reputation in South Carolina would bring new volunteers to the colors. In retrospect, Lee regarded this as the great mistake he made during the campaign, because it crippled him in dealing with subsequent federal operations against his right flank. When the movement was ordered there seemed no alternative to it, unless Sherman was to be permitted to advance unhindered up the coast. Before Butler's cavalry could get underway for South Carolina, a great federal fleet again appeared off Wilmington, convoying an infantry force on transports. This time there was no delay and no experimentation with powder boats. Under the direction of General Alfred H. Terry, the troops were thrown ashore and on January 13 a bombardment of Fort Fisher was begun. Before the early winter sun had set, two days later, the Union flag was flying over the shattered works and the last port of the Confederacy was closed. With Wilmington lost and Sherman about to march northward, the alarm in Richmond grew into a frenzy. Davis was blamed, as the executive of a waning cause always is, both for what he had done and what he failed to accomplish. Some of those who had been so insistent on a rigid interpretation of the federal constitution in 1860 now began to clamor for a dictator. Lee was to be the man. The president must step aside and place all power in the hands of the one person who had the genius to save the South. 
Longstreet had hinted at something of the sort in December, and Lee had ignored it. To his mind, the very suggestion was abhorrent and a reflection on his loyalty as a soldier and a citizen. So far as the record shows, nobody ever presumed to mention the subject to him personally. At length, as a sort of desperate compromise with Congress, the president consented to the appointment of a general-in-chief. As it happened, the nearest approach to an open break between General Lee and the president had occurred only a few days before. Late in January or early in February, there was an exchange of correspondence regarding the destruction of tobacco in the warehouses of Richmond to prevent its falling into the hands of the enemy. President Davis telegraphed Lee, in effect, rumor said to be based on orders given by you create concern and obstruct necessary legislation. Come over. I wish to have your views on the subject. Lee replied in cipher, which Davis had employed, that it was difficult for him to leave Petersburg. Send me the measures, his telegram concluded, and I will send you my views. This made Davis very angry. He replied at some length, and ended, Rest assured I will not ask your views in answer to measures. Your counsels are no longer wanted in this matter. Lee received this in silence when it was decoded, then quietly ordered his horse, rode to the railroad, and took the train to Richmond. When he returned, he said nothing of what had passed between the president and himself. Evidently, however, all misunderstandings were cleared up for, on February 6, Davis named Lee to the newly created office. The appointment came just at the time when the negotiations for peace at the so-called Hampton Roads Conference had failed and when the Federals were active on Lee's right flank. He had his hands full, more than full, and was under no illusions as to what he could do in general command. He wrote characteristically, I know I am indebted entirely to your indulgence and kind consideration for this honorable position. I must beg of you to continue these same feelings to me in the future and allow me to refer to you at all times for counsel and advice. I cannot otherwise hope to be of service to you or the country. If I can relieve you from a portion of the constant labor and anxiety which now presses upon you and maintain a harmonious action between the great armies, I shall be more than compensated for the addition to my present burdens. I must, however, rely upon the several commanders for the conduct of the military operations with which they are charged and hold them responsible. In the event of their neglect or failure, I must ask for their removal. He did not attempt to do more than he indicated in this letter and he did not consider that his appointment conferred the right to assign generals to command armies. I can only employ such troops and officers, he said, as may be placed at my disposal by the War Department. Those withheld or relieved from service are not at my disposal. It was all he could do to watch Grant, to conserve the strength of his dwindling army and to combat the dark forces of hunger and disintegration that had long been at work. In December, the shortage of provisions had become more acute than ever. No salt meat was available in the depots, and none was arriving from the south. In the emergency, the Navy lent the Army 1,500 barrels of salt beef and pork, but the Commissary General confessed himself desperate, and a special secret report to Congress bore out his dark view of the South's resources. In January, heavy rains temporarily broke down transportation on the Piedmont Railroad, which linked Lee's army with the Western Carolinas. About the same time, floods cut off supplies from the upper valley of the James River. Lee then had only two days' rations for his men and already had scoured clean the country within reach of his foragers. In this crisis, at the instance of the War Department, which fell back in every emergency on the magic of his name and on the compelling power of his appeal, he asked the people to contribute food for the army. Almost before he could ascertain whether appreciable results would follow this call, he had to march a heavy column to the extreme right to meet new federal demonstrations on Hatcher's Run. This was on February 5th, the eve of the very worst weather of a bad winter. The military results were negligible, but for three nights and three days a large part of the Confederate forces had to remain in line of battle, with no meat and little food of any sort. The suffering of the men so deeply aroused Lee that he broke over the usual restraint he displayed in dealing with the civil authorities. If some change is not made and the commissary department reorganized, I apprehend dire results, he wrote the Secretary of War. The physical strength of the men, if their courage survives, must fail under this treatment.
He did not demand the resignation of the grumbling Northrop, the Commissary General of Subsistence, but his reference to the necessity of a change was not lost on President Davis. This is too sad to be patiently considered, Davis endorsed on Lee's dispatch, and cannot have occurred without criminal neglect or gross incapacity. Within a few days, Northrop was quietly relieved of duty and was succeeded by Brigadier General I. M. St. John, who had much distinguished himself by his diligent management of the Mining and Niter Bureau. St. John was most reluctant to take the post, but he immediately organized a system by which supplies were to be collected from the farmers, hauled to the railroad and dispatched directly to the army, without being handled through central depots. Lee welcomed the change, and was encouraged by it to believe that if communications could be maintained, the army would be better fed. The people, he reasoned, have simply to choose whether they will contribute such stores as they can possibly spare to support an army that has borne and done so much in their behalf, or retain those stores to maintain the army of the enemy engaged in their subjugation. This view was at once made the basis of an ingenious appeal for food, addressed to the people of Virginia by a special committee of Richmond ministers and other citizens. A plan was outlined by which a farmer could ration a soldier for six months, much as money was raised in America during the war with Germany to feed Belgian babies and Armenian orphans. Anxiously, agonizingly, Lee awaited the response of the people. When he was asked early in March for an appraisal of the military situation, he postulated everything, in his reply, on transportation and on the willingness of the people to make further sacrifices. Unless the men and animals can be subsisted, he said, the army cannot be kept together, and our present lines must be abandoned. Nor can it be moved to any other position where it can operate to advantage without provisions to enable it to move in a body. Everything, in my opinion, has depended and still depends upon the disposition and feelings of the people. Their representatives can best decide how they will bear the difficulties and sufferings of their condition and how they will respond to the demands which the public safety requires. The representatives of Virginia in the Congress were brought together to answer Lee's question. He was present and told them of lengthened lines and thinning forces, of the privations the soldiers had to meet, and of the scarcity of food for them and for the horses. The Virginians replied that the people of the state, with loyalty and devotion, would meet any new demand made on them, but they seemed to General Lee to content themselves with words and assertions of their faith in their constituents. They proposed nothing, they did nothing. Lee said no more, the facts were warning enough, but he went from the building and made his way to his residence with distress and indignation battling in his heart. When dinner was over, Custis sat down by the fire to smoke a cigar and to read the news, but Lee paced the floor restlessly. He was so much engrossed in his own thoughts, wrote a silent young observer, years afterwards, that he seemed to be oblivious to the presence of a third person. I watched him closely as he went to the end of the room, turned and tramped back again, with his hands behind him. I saw he was deeply troubled. Never had I seen him look so grave. Suddenly he stopped in front of his son and faced him, well, Mr. Custis, he said, I have been up to see the Congress and they do not seem to be able to anything except to eat peanuts and chew tobacco, while my army is starving. I told them the condition the men were in, and that something must be done at once, but I can't get them to do anything, or they are unable to do anything, there was some bitterness in his tones. The general resumed his promenade, but after a few more turns he again stopped in the same place and resumed, Mr. Custis, when this war began I was opposed to it, bitterly opposed to it, and I told these people that unless every man should do his whole duty, they would repent it, and now, he paused slightly as if to give emphasis to his words, they will repent. It was on this visit to Richmond, or on another about the same time, that he was chatting with a group of gentlemen at the President's house when one of them said, Cheer up, General, we have done a good work for you today. The legislature has passed a bill to raise an additional 15,000 men for you. Lee, who had been very silent and thoughtful, bowed his acknowledgments. Yes, he said, passing resolutions is kindly meant, but getting the men is another matter. He hesitated for a moment, and his eyes flashed. Yet, he went on, if I had 15,000 fresh troops, things would look very different. Outraged as Lee was by the apparent incapacity of Congress, he warmly encouraged General St. John to do his utmost in applying the same methods of direct appeal the new commissary general had used with notable success in collecting NIDER, but as Lee sought to find food for his men he saw new military difficulties added to those of transportation, weather, distress, and growing public despair.
the danger of the destruction of all lines of communication with the South and the occupation of the only territory from which he was now drawing supplies were daily brought nearer and nearer. The perils and privations of the troops, in the opinion of an observant colonel who saw him often, were never absent from his thought. Bound up, now as always, with subsistence for the men was the old, tragic question of provender for the horses during a winter when there was no pasturage. It was the experience of 18621863 and 18631864 more poignantly repeated. Many of the army wagons were used, during most periods of quiet, to collect food and bring it to the railroad. When the army was in a country that had not been stripped of food the wagons could gather enough to make up for the deficiencies of the regular supply from the depots. Now, the territory around Petersburg having been swept of the last provisions, such horses as were not too feeble and too ill-fed to be sent out had to be used at a long distance from the army in North Carolina and in western Virginia. Those that remained had then to be fed at places where inability to employ them in foraging made the army wholly dependent on what came by railroad. The familiar vicious circle thus was rounded more speedily than ever, and the mobility of the army and its range of vision were hourly decreased. There was danger that the troops might remain where they were until, in a literal sense, they had no horses to move their trains. Yet Lee could not circumvent this by an early departure from Petersburg because the mud was so heavy the teams could not pull the wagons. He had to wait until the roads were better, even if he had to risk immobility then. What was true of the wagon trains applied also, of course, to the artillery. The horses had to be taken from most of the guns and scattered throughout the countryside, at a distance from the line, in order to keep them alive. As late as March 20 it had not been possible to call in even the animals of the horse artillery. Many commands had to be consolidated and reorganized because there were not enough horses for all the batteries. The cavalry suffered with the wagon train and with the artillery. No substantial force could be kept close to the infantry. When Butler's division was sent off, the horses were subsisted in North Carolina. Two other divisions were scattered in small units because supplies could not be transported to the places where the troops should have been concentrated. At the time of the operations against Hatcher's Run, in February, W. H. F. Lee's division had to be brought 40 miles, by roundabout roads, from Stony Creek, where forage was being delivered. Early in March, when it was necessary to send out cavalry on a forced reconnaissance, five days elapsed before Fitz Lee could get his men together and start after the enemy. Rooney Lee, called up at a critical hour, had to be returned to Stony Creek on the very day Lee thought that Grant's cavalry was being heavily reinforced. Before the end of the winter, Lee was uncertain whether he would be able to maintain even a small cavalry force around Richmond. There was virtually nothing he could do to maintain the arm of service on which he had to depend not only for early information of the enemy's movements but also for the protection of his communications and for the safety of his right flank from a sudden turning movement. He urged the government to new endeavor in procuring horses, and when it was reported that animals could not be had for lack of money, he frankly advocated the seizure of cotton and tobacco, their sale for gold and the purchase of horses with this medium. Nothing coming of this, he was compelled to extemporize new tactics. Infantry were to be stationed as close as possible to any point whence the enemy was expected to start a raid, and were then to be moved rapidly to support the thin cavalry that might be thrown forward, a scheme that seems to have been proposed by Longstreet. This meant, of course, that the defensive line had to be weakened, and the danger of a break increased by this detachment of infantry, even when troopers who had no horses were put in the trenches. It was a grim plight for an army that once had boasted a Stuart and stout squadrons of faultlessly mounted boys who had mocked the awkward cavalry of McClellan as they had ridden around his army. Desertion continued to sap the manpower of the army. After Christmas, when the winter chill entered into doubting hearts and every mail told the Georgia and Carolina troops of the enemy's nearer approach to their homes, more and more men slipped off in the darkness. Desertions between February 15 and March 18 numbered 2934, nearly 8% of the effective strength of the army. From Pickett's division alone, a command that had won the plaudits of the world, 512 soldiers deserted about the middle of March, during the progress of a single move. There was suspicion that men from different brigades were communicating with one another and were arranging rendezvous. When they left, taking their arms with them, they usually went home, but not a few of the weaker-spirited joined the enemy.
from one division, a good one at that, 178 were reported to have gone over into the Union, in the language of the trenches. Conditions became so bad that when it was necessary to move one of Pickett's brigades through Richmond, Longstreet's adjutant general did not think it safe to let men wait long in the streets. The reasons for this wastage in an army that had been distinguished for nothing more than for its morale were all too apparent, hunger, delayed pay, the growing despair of the public mind, and, perhaps more than anything else, woeful letters from wives and families telling of danger or privation at home. Lee noted with much distress that the largest number of desertions were among the North Carolina regiments, which previously had fought as valiantly as any troops in his command. The army was melting away faster than was the snow. Lee had been able to do little about subsistence and the supply of horses, but desertion and the conditions it brought about were military problems. He faced them. After offering amnesty, he had to enforce very sternly the law for the execution of deserters who were recaptured, and when clemency was shown in a case where a court-martial had decreed the death penalty, he telegraphed, hundreds of men are deserting nightly, and I cannot keep the army together unless examples are made of such cases. He sent a large detachment to western North Carolina to bring back deserters, and he felt compelled to take from his insecurely held trenches a whole brigade to guard the crossings of the Roanoke River. The Articles of War on Desertion and the regulations forbidding any man to propose such a course, even in jest, were read throughout the army for three days. Longstreet issued an order in which he announced that he would recommend for commission with the proposed Negro regiments any man who thwarted the attempt of another soldier to desert. Despair had not entered every heart. If hundreds deserted, there were thousands who had resolved that neither hunger nor cold, neither danger nor the bad example of feebler spirits could induce them to leave Moss Robert. Many of them came to look upon the cause as General Lee's cause, and they fought for it because they loved him. To them he represented cause, country and all. The soldiers' letters of this dark period present a hundred contrasts. One Marylander wrote in January, there are a good many of us who believe this shooting match has been carried on long enough. A government that has run out of rations can't expect to do much more fighting and to keep on in a reckless and wanton expenditure of human life. Our rations are all the way from a pint to a quart of cornmeal a day and occasionally a piece of bacon large enough to grease your palate. A young North Carolinian, in precisely the opposite mood, expressed his regret that the people of his state were despairing because of the loss of Fort Fisher. If some of them could come up here, he wrote, and catch the good spirits of the soldiers, I think they would feel better. Lee understood the fears of the faint-hearted as much as he valued the courage of those who, knowing the cost to be hopeless, determined to sustain it to the end. In his appeals to all his men, he spoke now as a father to his sons. The little that he could do for their comfort, he did with warm affection. One winter's day, as he and his staff were riding along, he met four private soldiers plodding through the mud toward the lines. Stopping, he asked where they were going, and when they explained that they had been to Petersburg and were afraid they would not reach their posts before roll call, he had some of his officers take the men up behind them on their horses and carry them to the trenches. When a sergeant of the fine old 4th South Carolina came to Lee's headquarters and asked for transportation on a furlough he had earned, the general was distressed that the railroad pass had not been issued with the furlough. They ought to have given you transportation without putting you to this trouble, he said. He was accessible to all his men, even to the cooks. When one Negro attendant presented himself at Edge Hill, Lee had him admitted. General Lee, the man began, I've been wanting to see you for a long time. I is a soldier. Ah, uh, Lee answered, to what army do you belong, to the Union Army or to the Southern Army? Oh, General, I belong to your army. Well, have you been shot? No, Sa, I ain't been shot yet. How is that? Lee inquired. Nearly all of our men get shot. Why, General, I ain't been shot case I stays back ward de generals stay. Desperate as were the times, Lee found delight in that answer and repeated it more than once to his lieutenants. Of the men to whom the heart of Lee went out, the wounded always came first. One day he was journeying over to Richmond for an interview with the president. As the train neared the city, a crippled soldier got up and struggled to put on his overcoat. Nobody in the crowded car did anything to help him. Observing this Lee rose and assisted the veteran.
After he had seen that he could not count on the employment of the reserves, Lee had exerted himself in the early winter to organize the local defense troops in Richmond, but he found it progressively more difficult to get them out as the weather grew worse. He had sought, also, to retain the Negro laborers over the Christmas holidays. Although he had previously had a low opinion of the fighting quality of Negro troops, he saw now that the South must use them, if possible. After the beginning of 1865, he declared himself for their enlistment, coupled with a system of gradual and general emancipation. Congress hesitated and debated long, but at last, on March 13, the President signed a bill to bring Negroes into the ranks, though without any pledge of emancipation, such as Lee had considered necessary to the success of the new policy. Bad as was the law, Lee undertook at once to set up a proper organization for the Negro troops. While Congress had argued, Virginia had acted in providing for the enrollment of Negroes, slave and free, in the military service. On March 24, Lee applied for the maximum number allowable under the statute of the Commonwealth. The services of these men, he said, are now necessary to enable us to oppose the enemy. He urged on his lieutenant's new economy of force and he strengthened his lines against sudden attack. Personal appeals were made to return prisoners of war to waive the usual furlough and to rejoin their commands, all able-bodied men were taken from the bureaus, all leaves for officers were suspended, new combat rules and revised marching instructions were issued to meet changed conditions. All that Lee had learned in nearly four years of war, all that his quiet energy inspired, all that his associates could suggest or his official superiors devise, all was thrown into a last effort to organize and strengthen the thin, shivering, hungry army of Northern Virginia for the last grapple with the well-fed, well-clad, ever-increasing host that crowded the countryside opposite Lee's lines.